This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. Al Jazeera cameras toured villages and towns in South Lebanon. The town that sustained the most destruction was Ait al Shab, along the Israeli Lebanese border. According to eyewitnesses, the fiercest confrontations between Hezbollah fighters and the Israeli military took place in this town. One of Ait al Shab residents says with pride the town was destroyed, but it did not fall into the hands of the Israeli army. These are the effects of the war on the town. Its homes are almost completely eradicated. Perhaps the Israelis endured most of their losses in Ait al Shab. About 150 to 200 were either killed or injured. Eyewitnesses confirmed that 75 were killed. They were here, they escaped here, they were surrounded here, and they were killed here. One who goes to Ait al-Shab hears these kinds of phrases in the description of the fierce battles that took place in this town. Most of these battles happened between residential homes and sometimes inside them. I still remember their fear. They portray their soldiers as undefeatable, but they were actually defeated beneath the boots of the Mujahideen. This image is important. Let the entire world know who Hezbollah is and who the Israeli army is. The faces of these fighters did not emerge until the war ended. Hezbollah was not defeated in the military battles, and Israel was not defeated in the political arena. Based on this understanding, the ceasefire took hold here in South Lebanon. Hezbollah emerged from this ceasefire victorious in the war of determination, and Israel victorious in the war of annihilation. These are some of the images of the annihilation war in the Jubail town. An old woman and her daughter were killed outside their home and their bodies are still laying there. The father who was in the next room wasn't in any better shape. Thank God they were defeated. Thank God Hezbollah defeated them. They could not get to the Litany River and accomplish anything. They killed the people, but thank God they were defeated. They were stepped over. I want to speak. I'm not better than the people who died. The Israeli army is still inside the Lebanese territories, but news reports from Dubail indicate that some Israeli machinery was being pulled back. This is how the first day of the ceasefire ended in South Lebanon after a very costly war. Abbas Nasr Al Jazeera Television, Ait al Shab. In an unprecedented interview since the war on Lebanon began, the Al Jazeera correspondent in Lebanon was able to meet and interview one of Hezbollah fighters from the border town of Ait al Shab. The fighter described the nature of battles that took place between the Hezbollah party and the Israeli army as ferocious and wild, adding that the Israeli army sustained heavy casualties in this war. It has been said that the Israeli army could not be defeated. Here in Ait al Shab, it was proven otherwise. The Israeli army was always on the run, just like sheep when they heard the sound of explosions. In fact, the Israeli army was more scared than sheep at the sound of gunfire. Sheep might have gotten used to the sound of shelling, but you could hear the Israeli soldiers screaming hundreds of meters away every time a bomb exploded. Where did the battles take place? Can you describe what happened here? How did you resist the Israeli army? Where were you? Were you in a house or in an open area? How did you resist the Israelis? What exactly happened? 
The first battle took place in an area near the town's mosque. A Zionist army force raided a local resident's home. While inside the home, Hezbollah fighters opened fire on the Zionists. We heard the Israeli soldiers crying out in fear. They tried repeatedly to recover their dead and wounded soldiers and flee, but they failed to do so. After the Israeli army used artillery and aerial raids to pound the area and surrounding houses, the Israeli commandos managed to recover the bodies of their dead soldiers and ran away. Upon entering the house, we saw a lot of blood-stained bandages and some ammunition left behind. This was the general picture there. Can you tell us about the days that follow this battle? Can you give us a rough estimate on the number of Israeli casualties? I would say that the Israelis sustained at least 50 casualties in the town of Eid al-Shab alone, not less than 50 casualties. Does this estimate apply to the entire period of the fighting? Yes, during the two weeks of fighting. Here's fighting in Eid al-Shab lasted nearly two weeks. What kind of war booty did you get? The Israeli army left some ammunition and military equipment behind. In general, these were some of the war booty left behind. Can you tell us what had happened in this area? Several bulldozers were deployed by the Israeli army to demolish some houses in this area. What exactly took place here? After the Israeli army was defeated in Ayn al-Shab, it tried to invent a victory for itself. Under heavy air cover, four Israeli bulldozers infiltrated into Al al-Shab from the al-Rahib and Rania sides. The Israelis used these bulldozers to destroy the residents' homes. The Hezbollah fighters opened fire on the Israeli convoy and damaged one bulldozer. The Israelis failed to retrieve the damaged bulldozer because they came under heavy fire from the Mujahideen or freedom fighters. Consequently, the Israeli army destroyed it completely. Which battlefront were you fighting on? Generally speaking, I was fighting on this battlefront. The following meeting that you are about to see was unpredictable in its outcome. It happened after the ceasefire started on the Lebanese side of the border. On one side was the commander of the north, General Udi Adam. On the other side, a group of reserve soldiers for the armored division. Both sides had a lot to complain about. One hour after the ceasefire started, General Adam met a tank reservist unit who came back after days of battle. We are in a ceasefire situation that has many defects. The agreement reached is a good one. However, its implementation is a difficult task. I am telling you this because you are the guys who will pull the trigger. The next few days are critical. Forget the war between the generals. I, as a soldier, and we need to know that this is a military victory. We fought, as I would define it, an Iranian commando division. The soldiers were very careful in the way they spoke out, but a lot of what they experienced in the months of fighting was burning them from the inside. I'll talk about the failure and the dead soldiers reservists who were killed by friendly fire. Why? Because of the lack of coordination when a tank comes into the area and does not know who is in this house and shoots because one sees someone moving. There were many incidents, but compared to a battle situation, this is okay. Do you have an assessment on how many Hezbollah soldiers or terrorists were killed? It does not matter what you call them. They are not soldiers, they are terrorists. They are professionals with the latest weapons, and we were in 10-year-old tanks, and they had a clear mission, and that is to finish us off. Do not say they are not soldiers. They are. They are your enemy. You are sending us on a mission as if they are not soldiers. They are. 
After many weeks in the bunker, the residents of Kiryat Shmone came out onto the streets with a lot of apprehension. They wanted to see what remained and what was destroyed. Most of them were going to spend the night in shelters, although the army had told them to go back to their homes. Here is our report from Minshim Harowitz. In the morning, the traffic in the road was all military, but in the afternoon, it was all civilians coming back to their homes. I am coming back from Herzliya. How long were you there? I was there over a month. Did you miss your home? Very much. I had a real longing. Not all families went back. Some are still waiting to see if the ceasefire will hold. But many are still in the bunkers, scared and mainly disappointed. I do not believe in this ceasefire. Do not believe in it. I made this my second home and decorated it, brought a refrigerator, but we were hit by our government. That's a pity. This is a very thick tin roof. Some are wandering around town to see the destruction. For them, the shelter became a second home. Did you leave Kiryat Shmona? I always stay here. Were you in Kiryat Shmona all this time? It is difficult for me to become a refugee. Since the Holocaust, I was a small child. This is from my mother, a terrible feeling of being a refugee. Good evening, and we open with this update. Uh, less than an hour ago, IDF soldiers in southern Lebanon opened fire on a group of Hezbollah gunmen. According to IDF reports, five Hezbollah terrorists were killed in that exchange. And despite the sporadic violence, day two of the ceasefire, and it seems to be holding, the IDF began its large-scale withdrawal from Lebanon today and is expecting to bring back all of the reserve units by Saturday. There is talk that the Lebanese army could deploy in South Lebanon by uh, tomorrow. IDA's Eli Wolglander has more. The troop withdrawal from central Lebanon began at 6 o'clock this morning with tired and dusty soldiers saying hello and goodbye, capturing the moment on film and eagerly seeking out the simple pleasures of civilian life like a cigarette or a pastry. While troops were moving south toward the Israeli border, negotiations were continuing on the deployment of Lebanese soldiers throughout South Lebanon and the status of Hezbollah fighters and their arms. The United Nations force is expected to begin deploying throughout South Lebanon within 24 to 48 hours, and Lebanon's defense minister, Elias Moore, said the Lebanese army would send 15,000 troops north of the Latani River at the end of the week, ready to enter the southern border area. But he said the army would not be disarming Hezbollah, quote, and doing the work Israel did not. According to the London-based Al-Khayat newspaper, a compromise agreement is now being hammered out between Hezbollah and the Lebanese government, which would allow Hezbollah to keep hidden weapons in South Lebanon. Meanwhile, Hezbollah terrorists fired four mortar shells at IDF forces in South Lebanon overnight, but none were fired over the border into Israel. IDF soldiers did not return fire, and no casualties were reported. The IDF announced that Air Force pilots had targeted 7,000 sites in Lebanon during the month-long war, and that the Navy pounded Hezbollah targets with 2,500 artillery shells. Some 550 to 600 Hezbollah terrorists were killed over the course of the fighting. Ellie Wald will enter IVA News. And now with residents of the north beginning to make their way uh, home and think of rebuilding their homes and their lives, we go live to IVA's Viva Press, who is in Matula. Viva, what's going on up there, way up north in Matula? Yes, Leah, indeed. I am standing here in Matula right now, but I spent the day in Kiryat Shmona, where I watched residents come back to their home. And people, I must say, overall, were happy to be back home. They were happy that they weren't moving around uh, between relatives in the south or between hotels uh, in the center south of the country. People were happy, but they were also worried. Worried about two things. One, whether or not the ceasefire is going to hold, and two, about their property damage. Now, there has been a lot of property damage here. You have to remember that more than 1,000 Katusha 
ashes landed in the Kiryat Shmona area. I met a number of property tax authorities, um, government officials surveying the damage, people surveying the damage. People were a bit worried about sleeping in their homes with broken windows. Uh, insofar as the government authorities, they're saying people will be reimbursed. Uh, Foreign Minister Tzipi Livni also spoke to heads of the communities, heads of the northern communities, and she said to them, look, we have a plan. We're going to rebuild these communities. You don't have to worry about it. On the one hand, people are coming out a little bit more, sitting in cafes. On the other hand, I wouldn't say it's quite back to routine just yet. Businesses are still closed. Uh, as you mentioned before, uh, the incident with the Hezbollah gunfighters, five Hezbollah gun, uh, terrorists killed in South Lebanon. The Home Front Command is saying despite that incident, it is safe to come out now, come out of your shelters. People are still in their shelters. It's time now to rebuild the north, uh, rebuild your lives here. The Katushas should be over. Leia. Viva Press in Matula. Thank you very much. And I think, Viva, it's time for you to come home. Thank you, Viva. Well, several of the soldiers who were killed over the past few days during a fighting in Lebanon were laid to rest today. Captain Bnaya Rain, age 27, from Karnei Shamron, was buried at the cemetery in his hometown. Sergeant Major Yaron Amitai, 45, from Zichron Yaakov, was laid to rest at the cemetery in Zichron. Sergeant Major Elad Shlomo Ram, age 31, from Haifa, has been buried at this hour at the military cemetery in the northern city. Sergeant Major Sami Benaim, age 39, from Rehovot, is also being buried at this hour at the cemetery in his hometown. Staff Sergeant Adam Gorin, age 21, from Kibbutz Marbarot, will be buried in one hour's time at his kibbutz. Sergeant Major Peter Ochoteski, age 23, from Lord, will be buried at 6.30 this evening at the Lord Cemetery. Sergeant Major Ron Mashiach, age 33, from Gadera, will be laid to rest at 7 this evening at the military cemetery in his hometown. And Staff Sergeant Uri Grossman, age 20, from the Vaseret Zion near Jerusalem, will be buried in one hour at the military cemetery at Mount Herzl in the capital. The funeral date of Staff Sergeant David Amar, age 24, from Kiryat Shmona, has yet to be announced. Major Nissan Shalev, age 36, from Kibbutz Evron, will be laid to rest tomorrow at 5 p.m. And the funeral date of Sergeant Major Karen Tendler, 26, from Rehovot, the only woman soldier to be killed in the war, also has yet to be announced. Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad says the American and British perpetrators of the Zionist regime's savage aggression on Lebanon, who delayed an early ceasefire, share the heinous crimes by the Israeli army and should be brought to justice. That was part of President Ahmadinejad's address to a large gathering of people in the northwestern city of Ardebil on Tuesday. Ahmadinejad blasted the U.S. and Britain for blocking the measures for a truce in the Israeli-imposed war on Lebanon, saying these two countries have discredited the United Nations Security Council, hence not qualified to member the body any longer. Elsewhere in his remarks, President Ahmadinejad said those who advocate the new Middle East are against freedom and independence of the nations in the region. The president added, the regional nations are seeking a new Middle East as well, but an independent one and free from the hegemony of Israel and the United States. Meanwhile, as it is typical of the president's provincial tours, a large number of residents wrote letters to the president. <laughs> Syrian President Bashar al-Assad said Tuesday peace in the Middle East would remain elusive for the foreseeable future, and the U.S. is to blame. In a speech to the Syrian journalists, the Syrian president said the Zionist regime of Israel has to return Arab land it has been occupying since 1967 or see more hatred. He also said Hezbollah's actions would make Tel Aviv think twice before pursuing terrorist policies in the region. The Syrian president continued it is an honor 
for his country to support Hezbollah in its resistance against Israel and that such a resistance is legitimate. Assad accused Israel of using the capture of two soldiers on July 12th as a pretext for launching its massive assault against Lebanon, saying Israel is an enemy founded on the basis of aggression and hegemony. Thousands of Lebanese headed home to South Lebanon on Tuesday as the UN truce between Israel and Hezbollah held for a second day and Israeli forces began pulling back from some positions they had occupied. Aid agencies struggled along bomb down roads through by the Lebanese returning home to reach people wounded or trapped by war in southern Lebanon. The UNHCR refugee agency said a huge portion of the estimated 900,000 people displaced by the war are streaming out of shelters around Beirut and northern Lebanon to the south to see what remained of their former lives. The Zionist official said the army plans to start handing over some pockets of territory to UN troops in a day or two. Meanwhile, Lebanon's Defense Minister Elias Moor said the Lebanese army would send 15,000 troops to the north of the Litany River around the end of the week ready to enter the southern border area. But he said the army would not disarm Hezbollah fighters who have controlled the area for six years. Zionist military officials said on Tuesday Tel Aviv has 13 Hezbollah prisoners and the bodies of dozens of its members that it could offer in exchange for two captive soldiers. Israel had originally insisted that Hezbollah unconditionally release the captured soldiers, but the officials indicated Israel is ready for an arrangement through a mediator that could ultimately lead to a release of the prisoners it holds. The Syrian President Bashar al-Assad announced that the Israeli war on Lebanon did not accomplish anything except for more failure for Israel and its allies and masters. Assad confirmed that the so-called New Middle East, built on humiliation, dishonor and depriving people of their rights and identity, has become an illusion. He added that the real New Middle East is built on the accomplishment of the resistance and the exposure of disguised masks. Assad also drew a connection between the death of Rafiq al-Hariri and international resolutions and some Lebanese political blocs. Assad described these Lebanese groups as Israeli-produced constituents. <laughs> The outcome of the war was a failure for Israel and its allies and masters, and more perseverance for the national blocs and the resistance. The ideology of the resistance was planted deep in the hearts and minds of millions of people in the Arab and Islamic region. Some Lebanese groups failed to accomplish their plans which serve Israeli interests. Therefore, they incited Israel to come militarily to Lebanon to save them from their trap crush the resistance and steer Lebanon on Israeli tracks. There has been some cover-up in the war in Lebanon by some Arab groups, which had sought the help of the international community to find a way to strike the resistance. Some groups immediately started talking about the disarmament of the Lebanese resistance even before the blood of the martyrs had dried up. Their priority is to save the internal situation facing the Israeli government by either steering strife in Lebanon or disarming the resistance. They want to shift the problems from Israel to Lebanon. I would like to tell them and the Israelis the good news of their defeat. Those who supported Israel and encouraged it to invade Lebanon are the ones responsible for the destruction in Lebanon. I hold the May 17 group responsible for the destruction, massacres and the war from its start to its end.
Two booby trap vehicles exploded in eastern Baghdad, killing at least seven Iraqis, injuring 14 others, and causing substantial property damage to nearby commercial stores and cars. This news came as the American military forces began to adapt new tactics of dealing with Iraqi residents of Sunni Arab descent. The United States amended its staggering Baghdad security plan in an attempt to tighten the United States' grip over the Iraqi capital and stop any further attacks. Baghdad, which has become a dangerous place to live, witnessed yet another bloody day. Baghdad residents are no longer immune to the death or destruction that may strike at any time. More than 50 Iraqis are killed in daily attacks in and around the Iraqi capital. The most recent bomb attack took place two days after the American military forces and Iraqi police started to implement the second phase of the so-called Baghdad security plan. 50,000 Iraqi police and army officers and more than 10,000 U.S. soldiers took part in the security operation. However, this staggering security plan failed to meet its objective of ending the violence in Baghdad. Meanwhile, the U.S. military forces are trying to change their strategies. In the town of Durra, south of the Tigris River, where sectarian violence between Sunnis and Shias has erupted on many occasions, the U.S. military forces and Iraqi police have gained control over the security situation. The town of Durra, which is predominantly Sunni Arab, has not witnessed any attacks since the implementation of the U.S. security plan. The question now is how to keep it that way. The Iraqi government is working in conjunction with the Americans to create economic opportunities to local residents in Durra. The Iraqi and American military forces are expected to expand this security plan to other areas. They adopted a new strategy in Durra. They offered security protection to independent contractors in order to rebuild the city infrastructure. Contractors in Dora were hired to fix damaged roads, water pipelines, and commercial centers. It seems that the U.S. military forces are focusing on reconstruction efforts in Dora rather than pursuing Iraqi militias responsible for armed attacks. This phase of the security plan in Dora was named Defending the War Campaign. It is expected to expand to other areas such as the predominantly Shia town of Sha'ala and the predominantly Sunni town of Al Amriya. In fact, the U.S. military forces started to implement the security plan in the town of Al-Amriya. All roadways leading to and from Al-Amriya have been sealed off for the second consecutive day. American forces deployed dozens of military tanks and armored vehicles at the city's parameters. They carried out home raids and detained several local residents. Meanwhile, the U.S. and Iraqi forces are trying to implement the second phase of the security operation in Baghdad. They carried out home raids and detained 19 local residents in the city of Ramadi. More Moreover, they raided several areas in downtown Samara, burned down two homes, and detained a number of local residents. According to a Iraqi government source, the Iraqi police discovered several factories assembling booby-trapped vehicles. Several suspects were arrested and dozens of stolen cars were impounded in this sting operation. The Iraqi government also confirmed that several terrorists were detained and a number of booby-trapped vehicles were dismantled in another sting operation. Furthermore, hundreds of Iraqi security vehicles were deployed in the streets of Baghdad. The Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki vowed that Iraqi law enforcement agencies will pursue and bring to justice those responsible for the sectarian violence in Iraq. Some armed groups affiliated with the Iraqi resistance confirmed that the violence in Iraq will not end unless the Iraqi government cancels the law which calls on the rooting out of Ba'athists and the dismantling of Iraqi militias. In order to curb the violence, the Iraqi government must also recognize the legitimate right of the resistance and must set a timetable for the withdrawal of foreign troops from Iraq. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. Please visit linktv.org backslash mosaic for more information about these broadcasters or to view previous Mosaic programs, obtain program transcripts, or receive the weekly Mosaic Intelligence Report. Mosaic is made possible by a grant from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Additional support is provided by the Firedall Foundation, the Otto Haas Charitable Trust, and by committed Link TV viewers like you. If you value this program, please send your tax-deductible contribution to Link TV 
either through the website or the mailing address listed on your screen. This program was brought to you by Link TV for educational and non commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. television network devoted to global and national news with uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs. Programs which connect you to the world.